So thank you, Remy. Thank you, Alexi, for hosting this, this event. And it's so good. Thank you, Twitter, and all my former colleagues, whom I love so dearly. Uh, it's, so, it's so great to, to see you all and be back here. So um, unfortunately, well, I mean, you know, Alexi wanted me to talk a little bit about Basil, but I wasn't really going to talk about Basil with Ulf here, who can tell you so much more about it. And you know, I would embarrass myself. So what I'll do instead is give a brief sales pitch for why Bazel is arguably one of the most exciting pieces of technology that's happening right now in the open source world that, I, that I'm, a, and I'm a big, big booster of, and I really want to see it succeed. So we do use Bazel at Stripe, and uh, what is Bazel? Bazel is a build tool. So I think that functional programmers in the future will look back on these days and think that the, the way that we're building code right now is as like, you know, uh, primitive and grotesque as the days before code review or CI. And each of us thinks like, oh, back in the days before code review, I would have done code review. Those people were terrible. Or unit testing, I would have done unit testing, but actually people developed software for a long time without doing unit testing. And then now we, we sneer at them. And functional programmers, sadly, can be a little bit of an arrogant bunch. They may even look down on some of these people. But what Bazel is trying to sell you on is the idea that your build should be a pure function. And like, you know, so I'm from the South, and I've had half a drink. So, you know, it's like, let's, uh, let's uh, you know, we need to, you know, get religion about that idea. I think that functional programmers should understand. They should be like, hallelujah on that. That build should totally be a pure function. If I come with my sources, if I come with my dependencies, the output of that should be the same thing today as it was, is tomorrow as the following day. It's kind of crazy that we would accept anything otherwise. Now, people who accept otherwise sometimes say, oh, it's hard to do that, or it will take too long to do that, or you know, they'll, they'll have a long list of why it, it you know, can't be done. But it can be done, and so therefore, in five years, when this idea has won, and everyone knows it, and it's like, it's like you know, of course you have reproducible builds, and of course you do unit testing and you have code coverage, you want to look back and see, say that you are one of the people who understood that you know, way back before everyone else and you helped usher it in. So that's why you should be excited about Ulf's talk. He's going to tell you probably about caching and about how Bazel is very programmable. But to me, I think that, that, that Bazel really has the opportunity to be a Linux-like project. That we stop, like, like, having these parochial build tools, you know, SBT here, Maven there, maybe some weird package manager for my new fancy language over here. And we just say, look, here's one way that we, have, we describe functions from source into the outputs. And I can get bisect, rebuild that, and get the same thing in the past. Um, I don't have weird things that your laptop builds it one way, but CI builds it another, et cetera. So it's hugely important. And people who don't get it yet, they're going to get it. And you want to get it early. So that's about all I'm going to say about, about, about Bazel. We're using it at Stripe. We're 85% happy with it. And I've used the 15% to give, give all shit anytime I have an opportunity to. But, but that 85% is growing. And it's going to be 90% and 100% soon. So it's very exciting. So um, that's the Bazel portion of my talk. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit, a very similar talk, only slightly different, about, um, about feature engineering at Stripe. So if you are interested in machine learning, you are often thinking about you want to make a model of something. Like we want to model fraud. And if you download TensorFlow or if you download Scikit-Learn, you can train a model very easily now. It's a, you know, a, lot of, a lot of programmers are doing it. And the first thing you're probably going to do is give it some Something like this, some table of, of data. So here's a bunch of columns, and here's a bunch of rows, and maybe they have a bunch of bits, and you want to produce some label. So at, at, if you work on ads, you might be wanting to predict whether or not an ad will be clicked if you show it to a particular person in a particular context. If you work on fraud, you might want to answer the question, is this charge a, uh, going to be disputed in the future? Um, you might want to know if you're um, moving money around, is this a bad actor moving money or is it actually the person who should be moving the money? There's lots and lots of questions. If you're 
you know, driving a car, you might want to be, you know, predicting a regression of like, you know, where the road is going to be in, you know, 100 milliseconds or something. I don't know. But there's a lot of excitement about what tools to use to predict these, what kinds of models to use to predict these, and, you know, uh, or even, you know, uh, what kind of architectures uh, to, to run these models on. But we really have a really challenging problem is where does this data, where does this matrix come from? And that matrix in most organizations is very difficult to produce. You may have some databases someplace. You might want to go hit the internet to some service. You might have a geo IP table that maps geos to IPs, but that's changing and dynamic. You may have, um, you, know, a, you know, any number of like data sources you want to weave together. How do you do that and produce this matrix? Because this matrix is literally like a CSV. You could download it or you could put it in, like it's nothing more magical than that. So how do we turn those databases and event streams and everything into, into these tables? That's what I'm going to be talking about and how, we, how can we solve that with functional programming. So, um, you know, this is just a model. So we often use XGBoost, random forests, you know, we're, you know, I'm just a simple country boy from North Carolina, so I don't do these fancy models that maybe Google does. But you know, where we're from, you know, something simple like this would be fine, as long as we have this matrix. So let's, uh, let's figure out, how do we get this matrix? So here's Larry David expressing confusion. So, By the way, uh, I, uh, please interrupt me at any time with questions. I think it would be more fun um, if you want to steer the, the, the conversation in any particular direction. Or if you want to drill down and say, I'm not really interested in bullshit, tell me really how something is actually working. And I'll try to tell you more other than like telling you what features we actually use to prevent fraud for reasons which I hope are obvious. So this is what feature engineering is all about. Like, you know, a bunch of product engineers are all over the place, you know, fucking everything up. And then your job as like a data scientist or machine learning engineer is to collect all this stuff over here and turn it back into that table. So that's your job. It, you know, it sounds exciting. Apparently, all the kids want to do it, but this is mostly what it's all about, OK? So what are our key challenges that we want to do? So functional programming is often about, like the exciting thing about functional programming, the reason we people care about it, other than the kind of the you know, pseudo and quasi-religious aspects to it, um, are the fact that you can, with an architecture, rule out certain classes of errors. So immutability allows you to rule out certain classes of you know, race condition type errors where you know, maybe two threads are mutating something at the same time. Can't happen because they're not mutable. Things like this. You would just rule certain classes of errors out completely. So that's one thing about functional programming that's cool. So if this is a functional programming system for machine learning, what, what is it going to try to do? How can it like, kind of like rule out a class of error? So the contribution of this work, if we were, you know, if I still was an academic and we were writing papers, were that we are able to like rule out a class of errors like you might call label leakage. And a label leakage error is really bad in machine learning. Suppose you're trying, uh, someone told me an inter interesting example of this at Salesforce. At Salesforce, uh, they have user entered data. And I might be going to enter my data. So maybe I'm trying to predict if I'm going to be able to close a sales lead. Seems like an important thing to do for a lot of salespeople. If I know that I close them, then I get lazy and stop filling in the rest of the data and I just said, yeah, I closed them, right? So machine learning, what does it do? It's very clever. It says, oh, I got it. If a lot of the row columns are empty, you're gonna close them, you know? <laughs> this was an actual problem and it's label leakage because that label got applied to data like, and they kind of sent that information back in time. In fact, missing data when it, the first row was first created is not predictive that you're going to close them, but missing data like, you know, that was filled out with future knowledge, that is predictive, obviously. That's label leakage. The label kind of leaked back in time to what you were trying to predict. This can also happen in trading system, algorithmic trading systems. You train it on data, you know if it went up or down. If you somehow have any function that can somehow loop back around and encode the variable you're trying to predict, and that get into that matrix in an earlier row, then it tells you a lie. It, it can learn very effectively 
that, you know, you know, the label that you're trying to do. That's what we're trying, that's what this talk is going to do. I'm going to try to convince you that we're going to rule out a whole class of label leakage errors and that makes it much easier to feature engineer and produce models that work without getting some surprises that they work in training but not in evaluation. Okay, so to a lesser degree, we do a couple of other things which are cool, but they're like, I, I don't know, I think it's less cool than this. Um, one thing is that we're able to describe uh, these uh, features in a way that's consistent between training and scoring. Scoring happens in real time and the events come in and in milliseconds we need to rebuild the features as they exist and then score them. So that's going to necessarily be a different system that produces that big matrix for producing the model in the first place. If the, if the data scientist has to write one batch of code over here to produce the, the training data, but another batch of code to put it into production, this is an opportunity for another error, right? Because they might mismatch, they might actually like, have like systematic bias, not, er like, not like random bias, and you can really have a bad day. Um, we, we rule that out. So um, these are kind of, uh, the, the last thing is, like this is kind of cool, it's related to this, is that we're going to produce a historical value at any point that we would have seen at the moment that we were scoring the data. So it's impossible to express some like ability to look in the future. We take time out of the picture. So since there's no time in there, the system owns this notion of time. You can't like as a user talk about like, you know, one feature is like, you know, what, what the DAO will be like, you know, on the, you know, April 1st. There's no notion of time. You can't like look up in time. There's, you, just, you just can't express it. So that rules it out. So we'll, we'll see how do we do this, okay? Those are the kinds of challenges we're trying to solve. So it turns out in the functional programming community, um, they've talked about this notion of functional reactive programming. And it dates back, I think this is the first page, paper, um, to 1997, I think. Two big names in the academic literature on functional, react, on functional programming. But the idea is that you have two concepts, an event and a, feature, and a, and a, and a behavior. I just gave the whole game away. Uh, but anyways, you have an event and a behavior. And a behavior is this kind of time varying thing that can change in reaction to events. So that's the reaction part. So it's functional because we have, uh, we, you know, it's, there's no mutation. We have referential transparency. We have types, everything's nice. But uh, you know, we can lift a value into behavior Behavior is kind of a weird name, so, um, but we, we, we do something very similar. Um, we, so we learned from this, well, we learned from this, we learned from Elm, which is a nice programming language that, that talked about functional reactive programming for user interfaces. Uh, we also learned from, uh, there's kind of this reactive programming kind of uh, marketing uh, pitch that was, was done. But all these kind of ideas are sharing a lot of similar kinds of concepts. So we have some of the, the, the standard functional programming concepts here. Um, we can take a, an event and we can transform it. So it's a functor if you're into, into, into functional programming. It's the map in MapReduce. So we can map our, our events. The reduce in MapReduce is we can reduce our events and turn them into behaviors. I don't actually have the, the re really fancy uh, function that does that here. The other uh, concept that we have in, that are really nice, we talk about monads, if you're interested in functional programming a lot, you've probably heard this, or at least seen jokes. Every, if, you're, if you're not a program, you at least know you're supposed to maybe laugh when you hear someone say monad, or there's something related to burritos somehow, or whatever. But there's something weaker than a monad called an applicative, and that's when you have like two of the same kind of containers, and you can glue them together uh, and make a single container. Like if you give me two lists, I can put them together with a function that combines each element wise and make a new list. Or I could do that with, you know, so many things. Um, I could do that with a optional value. I could do it with a map. I could do it. Containers are very common examples, but you can do these with parsers. There's lots of interesting examples, command line parsers, recursive descent parsers. There's all sorts of different things that can fit into this model. So this abstraction becomes very, very nice. So what does this have to do with machine learning? So rather than behaviors, we're interested in a feature. So what is a feature? So if you're not working in the machine learning community, we use this term 
um, to refer to like a, you know, you know, like a facial feature or something, but it's any input into a model. So that is what a feature is. It's just a dingus or whatever you want to call it, but like it, it, that's just the term we use. So a feature really is, you can think of it as a real number, but it's some time varying thing. Like, you know, it might be, you know, how many times has the user clicked on like this person's tweets? It might be how many charges has this merchant run through Stripe? For Google, it might be how many times has this person searched for this query? Um, how many times when, they, when you search with this query, do you click uh, a page that also contains this word? Things like this. Any kinds of like, like uh, predicates or scalars are very simple examples of what can be features. But features critically change in time. And that's a very challenging part of them. Uh, like how many clicks Lady Gaga has had on her tweets today or ever, that's a time varying thing. It's changing all the time. And if we we're going to use it to predict something, we had to know what it would have been when the, th when the thing, when, the, when it was when we were trying to predict it, right? We don't just want to know what it is now. So we have this time axis and the feature has a value. And then an event happens. And, you know, it's like I used to be a physicist, like, you know, uh, it's a little bit like there's like, uh, you know, here's where the particle comes in, bounces off the feature, deflects it up to some new value. So there, there can only be like changes between the features are only caused by events. What is an event? Event is, I mean, if you want to be, if you're, if you're an engineer, an event is some record that is on a Kafka queue. It's as simple as that. Like that is what an event is that, you know, we don't have to look further than that. So that's our vision of what a feature is. Um, and so if we have something like this, it sounds like we, maybe we have some, some, we've got some traction. We've got a relationship between events. And those are something I know. Those are things that come on Kafka queues. I know where those are. I know the team that can operate Kafka. I know who to call. Um, and I don't know, something with functions. And I can turn it into these variables that I can feed to TensorFlow. So it almost feels like I'm getting close to the full loop of what I'm trying to do in my job in order to get a paycheck and continue to exist on Maui, right? Any questions? Yes? Um, so you said like features don't change over time? No, they do. They do, they do change over time. They yeah. change over time. Yeah, when the event happens. Yes, sorry, uh, the question was, I said features, well, I think he's gonna say more, but, but he said, you said features don't change over time, but I think he wants to clarify, but I said that they do change, but what? what, what yeah, so you said the features change only when the event happens. Yes, so this is kind of like a ansatz or a, you know, some kind of assumption that we're going to make, that like we are going to, you can imagine any kind of feature that like just some, somehow magically, intrinsically changes, but I believe in a physical world. So if it changes, it must have been caused by something. And there are only causes for changes are events. This is kind of like a design decision. Got it. Okay. I was thinking more about like window functions. Yep. So a window function can be like, yeah, so that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting picture. Keep that in your mind. So the question was, what about a window function, which is some kind of like, like convolution or integral of this thing that is like a natural way to describe it. Um, so think about, we'll, we'll come back to that later. Let's put a pin in that, that concept. Like what kind of things can we do? By the way, uh, what I'm doing, yes, uh, go ahead. Oh, that's a great question. Is it, like, are you, try, are you planning to apply any TLA plus or temporal logic? And in fact, we have been playing with, with that a, only a little bit, but we're still at the hobby stage, so I have nothing to tell you. But, but I do find it very interesting. I think it can be interesting, mostly to prove the correctness of the systems that implement this, I think. But um, TLA plus, if you're not familiar with it, it's getting some uh, increased attention. It has been used. It's a model checking language. It's a way that you can kind of write computer aided proofs uh, of certain system properties that you might want. So that could be very useful for us to um, uh, probably to prove the correctness of an implementation that would, would run the system. But OK. So, um, so what we want to do is we want to take our, uh, you know, uh, you know, this, our, well, let's see. So 
the key thing here that you might find limiting, and by the way, my whole career as an infrastructure person is, and, uh, and again, back to Bazel, uh, if you can find these limiting abstractions around which, like once you've made this limitation, you can go forward and you know, leverage quite a lot, in Bazel, it will be that like things can be pure functions, so we can cache them and we can get a lot of nice things about them. In this model, it's that all features change as a as a result of an event. And events themselves are immutable values. We get to like derive a lot of systems benefits downstream of that. So, you know, one thing that we're going to do is that we're gonna allow an event to look up a feature value. That's something that's very natural. I need to be able to say if like the event just happened that the user wants to run a credit card charge. Okay, before I run that credit card charge, I want to go and say, how many charges has this user had today with this credit card number? That number should be the value. When I go to train my model, it had better be the value that we would have seen at that moment. It shouldn't be the value in the future or when I'm training. That's irrelevant. It doesn't matter when I train, it matters so I need to be able to, a way to describe when this event came in, which is user charge, look up, use, the, the user has some value associated with it, which might be a user ID, how many charges has, have they made? So we're going to allow that user event to read a row out of any of these features, but we're only going to allow it to happen at the time that the event happened. Not in the past, not in the future, like now. So there's like this implicit now that hangs along with everything. There always this now is relative to some immutable event, not to a clock on your wrist or your laptop's clock or anything like that, right? So that's a concept that we're gonna use. So what does the code look like? It actually is very, very simple. So like, you know, the, the idea is you wanna make these abstractions that like limit you enough that we can get a handle on, but are powerful enough to use. And so far, this appears to be one for our team. So there's two, um, uh, if, I hope that people, well, this is the SF Scala meetup, so if you don't like Scala, like, sorry, Kurt, whatever, you know, just screw you. You know, you gotta, you gotta, gotta look at Scala on the, on the side. Sorry, Ulf, he probably doesn't like Scala very much. Um, but we have two uh, events. We have two, uh, two types. We have the event type and we have the feature type. The event is just like, um, it's like a list. It's like a list of things that have times associated with them, right? So that's one way you can think, instead of list of A, it could be, uh, sorry, event of A, it could be in list of A. Um, and feature is a little bit like map, but it also has a time associated with it. It's a map that each of the values has a timestamp in some sense. And so rather than in each key, you, you, you can't look up a key on this, on this map. You come with a key and a time, and I'll tell you the value that would have been less than or equal to that timestamp, not in the future of. So like the greatest, uh, least upper bound, I guess, of that, of that timestamp. Or greatest lower bound, I, I don't remember which one. Uh, anyways, one of these. So there's a couple of things we can do. We can transform these much like we can transform maps, uh, sorry, lists. So everybody uses Scala or they even, maybe they're, you know, you know impoverished and can only afford Java, but even poor Java programmers know about like the streaming API and they can do maps now and they can have lambdas and everything. So you can map an event from, if I have an event of, you know, that has my, um, that I'm about to make a charge and it has my last name on it, I could map that event into just something that had like the, the first letter of my last name. That would be easy to do, right? We could just discard that information, right? So that's kind of what, what event can do. Or I could throw away some events. I might be watching all the events that come into Stripe, but that event is not interesting to me because it's a test event. Actually, Stripe has an API, and you can say test mode equals true, and those aren't real events. So I want to be able to filter and throw those out. So filter is very useful. If I have two event streams of the same type, I can concatenate them together, much like a list. If you give me a list event and another list of events, I can concatenate them together, no problem. So uh, events have the same kind of uh, behavior. This is why uh, people geek out about functional programming because once you think in the abstract terms, this behaves very similar to many other things you've seen before, which are very, there's like a set of like type classes you can associate with them. They're, you know, they're functors, they're, you know, functor filters if you use the CATS API. There's lots of other kinds of things you can associate with them. It's nice. 
But the feature is more restrictive. So we're not gonna let you do too much of this. And notice, time never appears here. I can't actually ask a feature, like what is the value at a particular time? This is how I prevent label leakage. It is not even in the API. There is no way to express this, okay? So I can change the feature value, but not the feature key. Or if you give me two features, feature of V and W, I could glue them together. Damn it, I had a typo. It should have, it should, that should have been uh, VW, but. Now, I've, I pulled a fast one here. I realized I haven't described what this K is, is. And a feature is always about something. Like, how many charges has Oscar made? How tall is Oscar? Uh, how much money uh, did, you know, Lyft, you know, charge yesterday? They're always about something. And much like the, the, the nice thing about MapReduce, before, before the Google approach of it, I think, I, I don't know, I believe it was the Google's contribution to say, we don't just have a map function and a reduce function, we could also parallelize with keys. So we could in parallel reduce many keys at the same time. So we can get parallelism on the map side, we can partition by keys and get parallelism on the reduce side as well. And so in the same way, you're gonna be able to architecturally get a lot of the same benefits. So the key here is the thing you're about, it might be a user ID, it might be a merchant ID for us, it might be a credit card, it might be a geolocation if you're trying to predict where our next like, you know, event is going to be. Um, but your K is what your feature is about, okay? And that you can't change. I can't map a feature and make it about something else. I can't map the key part to make a feature about me about ALF, it doesn't make any sense. You're not allowed to make that mistake. The feature about me is just about me. Like there's no operation on this object that allows you to change it in that way. So again, this is another class of error that can be removed from like, like a nonsensical concept is not allowed, right? So um, back to the functional programming, this thing is a functor, uh, it's not a monad, it's not an applicative. This thing is an applicative, it's not a monad, it's weaker than a monad. So, um, if, if you're interested in those kinds of things. So we have a, a very constrained uh, um, set of things. But in the previous slide, we could only turn events into events or features into features. So here's where the magic comes. We can take an event and a feature and look it up and attach the feature value to an event. So this is how we do these lookups. Imagine if, like a, the event was racing through your Kafka queue and it went over to your Redis store and read some data and attached it back to the Kafka queue and went back through. It might have done that or it might have been a MapReduce job that was looking at it all in batch and all the data was lined up, but it found the correct value in time. Not the value in the future, not the value in the past. We're not gonna even allow the user to try to do that join. You won't have the chance to do label leakage we're going to compile it in a way that that's, there's only the right way to do it, okay? So that's one, this is a very powerful primitive. And then the other thing is that we can take an event and we can say, we could just say, what is the latest value of this event? That is a feature. So as this event is changing in time, I could say, what is it now? What is it now? What is it now? So that's just a primitive that we can do. We can lift an event into a feature. So what is the, va the value that the feature has? So if you have an event with a key and a value, the event, the value has to be an option of V because it might not have happened yet. What if I filter all the events out? Nothing's come. Remember, a feature has a value at every moment in time from minus infinity to positive infinity. So the latest value has to be optional or if you're a dirty Java programmer, it can be null, okay? <laughs> So um, uh, anyway, um, the other thing here, back to the question of windowing, and talk to me after the talk. We, we, I, like, one of my hobbies in life is forcing everybody to write their computations as, as monoids. So we actually only allow you to, sum, to do that integral. So an integral is a sum, and a sum is like a monoid. So you can do this windowing but you have to express it as a monoid, and we have some nice libraries that allow people to do that. So some monoids are more efficient than others to express this way, but there's a lot of nice reasons why we want that associativity. So remember, again, associativity, a monoid is just something that's associative, and it also has an empty value associated with it. 
And um, the associativity we want because we want to leverage some more tricks in MapReduce and systems programming. So again, like the, the great trick of systems programming is finding little bottlenecks that you can push everybody through that they can get their work done, but if you know if they're going through that bottleneck, you can also do some great systems optimizations. That's the main trick of abstraction and like systems design in my view. So the other combinator that we have, we can combine two features together. So we have feature with feature, event to feature, and event and feature to event. Notice we don't have feature to event, which is very interesting. And our users like often get mad at me, but just because I'm perverse and I have no great reason to disallow it, I like keep not allowing it. No, um, <laughs> uh, the reason why we don't allow feature to event is it would require us to fully embrace that everything is an event in the universe. So if I say, what would that mean? How do we go from feature to event? Well, it could mean give me the event of every time a feature changes and tell me what the value is. Great, we could allow that. And so maybe I don't have the courage of my convictions. That would require us going 100% all in on every feature forever and always is event driven. And in the back of my mind, I have anxiety that we'll have some partner that will come to us and say, I have this mutable database and I'll periodically give you a table of values, but this is the feature and I will not tell you the events that generated it. And since the users don't seem to really need that function, I can usually just say, no, we're not going to add it, even though we could actually add it. But maybe, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll just become total zealots of the church of the event and we'll add it in the future. Okay, so um, it's really actually, the, the implement, implementation of this system is actually very easy. Um, uh, well, actually, like, so uh, all we do is we, we make a bunch of like fake things. Like this is the trick of functional programming. It's like, you know, like when you call the function, you're just, you make an object that says, okay, I called the function. Can you return that? So it's like, like how do I implement map? It's like I, I return a subclass of event that's like, I'm a mapped event, here you go. Like, user doesn't know, everything's great. And so once we've done all these things, what we've got is basically, then we have a compiler. So that portion of the library is very easy. We have a compiler that can look at basically a syntax tree that describes what the user wants. And then when the user goes to like run their program on Kafka or on Spark or on Hadoop, then we just go and interpret that, that list of like this, this syntax tree into like what it should be on that platform. And it's very similar, similar to co compiler design. I'm actually like totally lying. So basically what I'm saying is like the, actually the implementation is a massive pain in the ass and it's extremely hard. But like the front level implementation, when you like look first at what it does, it does nothing except this, this free design of like returning the logic of what you want. But this is nice because our users can know nothing about the systems. This is 100% business logic. There's not like some dot reducers somewhere or some like, you know, put on Kafka or deserialized bytes or whatever. It's just about business logic. And then it can totally be uh, an ML infra systems team on which I and Rob Story, uh, my colleague who's sitting in the audience are on this team. We can worry about these kind of systems questions. So um, in principle, it's a, great, it's a great deal. In practice, it turns out it makes a shit ton of work for our team and I'm starting to regret it. So uh, anyways, so um, because we're, uh, you know, I don't wanna spend too much time, but I, I, I could describe how map works, but I wanna actually give you some new uh, data that we didn't have before when I've talked about this in the past, which I hope might be interesting to people. So I guess the main thing I wanted to jump up and down about is this avoiding label leakage that this lookup uh, function is very magical. Um, I know many, I worked with colleagues at Twitter. I'm not even sure if we could, could, could describe this problem very clearly. If we were trying to predict who would follow whom, whom the whom to follow product, as you, you might be familiar with, or um, you know, tweet recommendations, I'm not sure we even really thought very much about this problem of temporal label leakage but it's incredibly important. I mean, if you screw it up in like Twitter, I mean, obviously they're not paying too much of attention to that product. But, um, but like, you know, in a, in a Stripe, Stripe product, you know, there's actual money on the table. So we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta really worry about it. So we have this pretty magical primitive of lookup. 
And as the feature is changing in time, I want my user to be able to say, okay, read the, the value, and the system is going to make sure it goes and reads the correct value. Not the value it's gonna be in five minutes, or the value it would have been a few minutes ago. It's gonna just give you exactly the right value, and you have no way to say, read the feature at time, you know, you know 1830 UTC. We don't, th that's not available to you. So that's like, you know, the thing that I think is very, very interesting, and you know, 10 years from now, when I'm receiving my Turing Award, I'm sure they'll be citing this, uh, this, this particular thing. So here are some examples um, and of, of why I won't be winning the Turing Award, because I'm, uh, I, I, I have terrible examples. But um, this is kind of what the code winds up looking like for very, very simple features. So you start with some events. In this case, it's a dumb unit test that we have of dogs. Like they might bark, and they howl, and they jump at different times. And then we can calculate a feature for each of the dog's name, how, how much, what's the average value of how loud it has been, the, 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 the volume of that, of that uh, bark. Or we can have a feature of has a, bar, a dog barked, right? Notice time doesn't appear there. Go ahead, Vlad. No, average is not tonality. Is that a monoid? Oh, I know it is a monoid. I'm so into monoids. I've got, I've got monoids all day long for you, Vlad. So, like, see me later. But anyways, it turns out it is. But, um, I mean, but average value is, computing the average, in fact, computing all moments is associative, but it does require tricky encoding. You have to also, this, this type carries with it the total count and also a stable value. So by itself, the average is, of course, Vlad is correct, that you can't just like combine averages. But if you carry with the average the total number of events you've seen, you can um, write the function that combines them associatively. So it's nice. Anyways. So that's that. But, but do we actually run it? So we do run it. And um, it is a real thing. And um, so here's like, uh, how, like the, this compiler that I described. So if you give me this feature, I, I can convert it in this kind of like interpretive loop back into how we would, if you gave me a key and the timestamp, I could you know, loop through and compute the value. And I bet if you see this, these kinds of examples, these kinds of functional interpreters, they're relatively common. If you're familiar with the functional programming library FS2, you can find some examples of this in there. Um, this is a very common thing. This is how compilers work. It's very close to a compiler. So you ultimately wind up writing a compiler. Our users, of course, don't do this. They don't even, they, they, they freak out when they even see this. Like, I want to add this feature. Can I just look at the code and add that? Yeah, no problem. Take a look. It's going it's to be a disaster. You're going to hate me. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, but our users see the nice API, but the system that we build is basically a compiler for them. We have like a MapReduce backend that can plan it to this intermediate representation that is like MapReduce, so we could run it on, say, you know, Storm or you know, Scalding or Spark. Uh, this is a very similar com computational model. And we also even have a third backend, which is this kind of like push-based real-time that we actually use. This is the one that we, we run in real-time, that it is going to go and talk in real-time to a bunch of stores as fast as it can and update those stores. And so the coffee, it reads from Kafka, it reads one event, and does this massive fan out, you know, scatter gather thing, and goes. So we have very, we have several different um, implementations, and we'll likely have more. I imagine that we'll, the ones that we have, will probably some of them will throw away, some of them will keep, and we'll make more, and everything's great. So the scatter gather API is actually pretty cool. We're actually using it in production right now, even at this moment. People are buying things on Stripe, and we're scoring it, and. Um, it takes about 60 milliseconds for our most complex features. So if you're into ops at all, you might, uh, your first thing is like, oh, 60 milliseconds is slow. It is slow. So what the hell are they doing? And if you look at some of these graphs, some of them have 1,400 events and feature nodes in there. The depth of these operations can be 60 and 80 different, like, you know, Read this, then map it to that, then go to this store, then do a little bit more, now read this, then go over there, and then we got 60 milliseconds later. 60 milliseconds is a long time, as far as the computer's concerned, but from a standpoint of making a transaction, it's actually not a very large portion of our, of our budget, and if we can approve the, the fraud protections for our merchants, 60 milliseconds is a bargain. So we're very, very, very happy to pay that. But I was quite blown away with this. This is an important number for anybody, any aspiring systems engineers out there, when we started working on this, there was a system that allowed one phase, one MapReduce operation. And people were like, I don't know if we really need more than that. 
And I was like, we will need more than that. People want more than that. I promise you when we do it, we will do it. We haven't been using it that long. So some user gives us this thing. It takes a very long time to do a backfill. I'm sad to say this backfill took about a week to do for all of the history of Stripe. And we were like, why is this? Am I a terrible programmer? Am I a bad person? All of the above. Um, so we looked at like, well, maybe the, the it, no, it's the kids who are wrong, right? That's the, that's, uh, that's the meme. And so, so we looked and we actually, wait a second, how damn big is this thing? Let's just take a look. And it's 1400, and I'm like, how did you even, how did you even write this out? I mean, like, where's all the code? And of course, once you give them a composable API, what do people do? They write loops and they compose and like, oh, for all these and for all those, and I'm gonna jam all these features together, and it's amazing. So people will take your API and push it way as far as you'll let them push it. And um, the performance of our models is improving though. And that's the bottom line. So that's what we want. So how does it fit together? I think this is the most interesting slide. This is a new slide. This is, uh, hasn't been done before. Um, actually, uh, again, because Eric uh, Osheim and I, uh, uh, one of my colleagues who, with whom I've worked most closely on this project, and I, as he likes to say, we're terrible people, um, we didn't make this plot, and people were wondering, uh, how does it work? How does it fit together? I'm just kind of confused. So it, it took a manager, actually, to get frustrated enough. It's like, I'm going to make a damn diagram of what the hell is going on here and figure it out. But this is what the whole picture looks like. So physical events, we call them, they come in, these are things that are bytes on a disk. They come into the picture. And then we have our logical events. Those were the things we saw earlier. These could be mapped sources or filtered sources or whatever, transformed in some way. These are, these are logical events. And then we can turn a, an event into a feature, but also features can look up other events. So they compose in a very interesting way. These are kind of at the logical level. Um, these physical events get written to S3 because we use uh, AWS. Now, the semblance compiler, this is the compiler that takes that abstract representation and converts it over into some kind of physical job that runs this thing. So we have a couple of different ways to run it. We can run it offline in MapReduce, or we can run it online with uh, this kind of push-based scatter-gather system. That system is called Peddler, um, just because I it just is. Um, so Peddler does this neat trick because everything's a monoid over there. It can look at our offline store that has aggregated the, the data up to a certain point, and then it can also look at the real-time differences. And because it's associative, it can combine those together. So we do this real-time um, Lambda architecture trick for free. Users, again, don't know a damn thing about it. It's great. Um, we then push those over onto another queue that the events have been fully materialized into like what their feature values are. And then our diorama, it's a, I guess, it's like a, you know, it's a, it's a little model, right? You know, a diorama, that's what I think it means. Anyway, um, that's our model scoring system. It scores the models. We either have predicted that it's like yay or nay, it's a, it's a good, good result, and we push it out. Um, we have this thing here, decibel, it, to measure the volume of things, get it? Stripes into puns, uh, maybe not always good puns. Anyways, uh, uh, this decibel thing can read the values back out for other system that needs to read the, the feature values at any moment in time. So it knows how to reach in and look at our um, Redis and sequence, which sounds kind of like sequence file, like that Hadoop might produce, so anyways. Lots of puns, sorry. So anyways, that's how it all fits together. So people ask the question like, hey, why don't you open source this? And it's kind of like, this is kind of like, you know, Ulf is gonna get up and he's terrible at open source. And one of the reasons he's terrible at open source is because Google has all this great technology that fits together pretty well. And he probably looks like, I'd like to open source this, but it kind of like, he pulls like the banana, but he gets a banana in the junk, you know, being held by a gorilla in the jungle, right? So that's the kind of joke. You don't really want that. You just want the banana, right? So. I would like, to, people ask, how can we open source this? Like, what part do we pull out? Like, any one part of this is not that interesting, you know? So we're still struggling with that. So it's just kind of complicated. We're just trying to figure it out. Maybe we can break it down somehow. Um, anyway, uh, Stripe's hiring. You can come work with me. Um, it's going to be so much fun. 
we're gonna have like such great times together. It will it will be the highlight of your career, really. Um, and we're building a lot of great stuff. You know, why would you want to work on data at Stripe? And like so many people are just moving these bits around. It doesn't really matter. But when we move it around and we fuck it up, like people lose a lot of money, and that's exciting and high pressure. <laughs> so like you know, if you're into that kind of excitement, come come join us. We do a lot of cool stuff. So if you've looked at data, like what is what is data at Stripe? We have this awesome thing where you can do SQL in the dashboard. We actually have this company called RunKit that you can write code in JavaScript in the dashboard and we execute it. And how badass would it be for, for our merchants who know nothing about all this to write code in the dashboard in JavaScript and then we lift it back into our feature engineering system and do it. You could come build that with me. It would be so great. But right now, we just have SQL in the dashboard, and they can query their data. That's a hard problem. How are you going to do that? Um, we also are doing all kinds of fraud protection. That's our radar product. It's about to get so amazing and awesome. Today, we had a, an amazing new launch. So that's why it's so great. So anyways, that's uh, what my talk was all about. I'm going to hand it over to Ulf. Uh, if you have any questions before I do that, I'd be happy to take one or two. Sorry, yeah, I should probably call on some folks. Uh, I'm going to go in the back. I think I saw him first. Yeah, it's a good question. So the question was, for, for features that depend on deltas, like what was the value four minutes ago or five minutes ago, you, can, you should be able to look back in time, not forward in time. How do you do that? So we do have that, and I, I kind of glossed over it a little bit. We have like the, event, uh, the ability to take an event and get its most recent event or its most recent K events as like, that's one transformation of an event. So one event can turn into like, a list of K events, which were the most recent K, and that allows you to compute different deltas. So we have a couple of things like that to make it easier for people. They're not super commonly used, it turns out, but we wanted to support them because we thought people might, might want them. Our, our main problem is classification. So the question was, uh, are the majority of your problems classification problems? Um, uh, you know, fraud or not, classification problem bad actor or not, classification problem. But we also are interested in regression problems for our users. Our, our, our users, many of them are very small businesses. They may want to forecast how many disputes am I going to have like this month. If it's too many, it's going to be bad news. How, what was my sales volume likely to be this month, next month, whatever. So those become regression problems. We don't really have a lot of the classical signals problems like voice, uh, image, sound. We don't have those now. We could have them in the future, you can imagine, but we don't know. Uh, also in the back. Um, I, you, is there an easy example of observable? Like, oh, um, yeah, that's a good question. So observable, like there's this observable abstraction. I, I wish I had a, a maybe I'll, well, anyways, I don't have a whiteboard. But um, if you think of, um, like uh, a single value and then a list is like one axis of things, right? So you can, like, you can imagine that's one kind of transformation you've done. You can take an A or you could have a list of A. But another orthogonal axis is A to future of A. You, you're going to have a value later. And an observable is kind of like both you have more than one value and you are going to get it in the, you know, in the future asynchronously, and that's kind of this abstraction people like to call observable. In fact, observable is pretty much identical to our event, but we don't want to make it a monad, which you can do for observable, because that will make it really difficult to get good uh, like, uh, systems performance. So we want to try to limit people on that as long as possible, but it may be in the, we, we may ev eventually promote event all the way up to observable, possibly. Um, I'm happy to take any questions later. I'm looking forward to hearing from Ulf, so thank you very much for your time.